All right, welcome everyone. My name is Greg Brandis. I'm the Dean of St. Francis School of Law. And uh, thank you for attending and joining us uh, to talk about some blurred lines, um, which by the way, I, I discovered was the name of a rather controversial song. So very, <laughs> very appropriate for a First Amendment uh, conversation. Uh, we're gonna talk tonight about the uh, problems or the challenges or the opportunities that present themselves with respect to uh, social media and conversations uh, on social media. Also in the context, of course, of whether uh, those companies uh, can or should or need to be regulated in some fashion or another. Um, I wanna remind everybody that this program is part of our observance of Constitution Day. Uh, today, September 17, is Constitution Day. And in 1787, uh, the leaders of the then young uh, United States of America signed the U.S. Constitution, a document that ended up being of some importance. Now, the most, thing, most important thing I'd ask you to remember on this day as we conduct ourselves on this topic is that if the conversation just happens to get a little heated, uh, which I don't expect it probably will, but if it does, um, it's a good reminder of the freedoms that we have to have this kind of conversation in public, uh, recorded, which by the way, you should note that it will be, and uh, uh, without uh, concern, uh, free and open to just about everybody. So um, today is a good day to reflect on those things and a great topic uh, for that sort of reflection. Uh, just one housekeeping matter, and that is that uh, we welcome your questions at any time uh, during the program. You should be able to submit them into the question and answer area uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to help folks with uh, sort of technical things as we go through the program. I do try to make an effort. For those of you who submitted questions uh, in advance to the program, however, we do have those. and We'll be working our way through issues that concern those very questions uh, through the course of our program together. Now, joining us today, uh, I'm so pleased and honored to be uh, joined by three uh, incredible constitutional uh, scholars and um, advocates. And uh, you've probably had a chance to read through their bios, but let me just acquaint you uh, briefly with them a little bit again. Uh, Stephen Rohde is uh, a law lawyer of many, many years, um, more than 50 years, as a matter of fact, practicing law, uh, working in the um, areas related to the Constitution, working on First Amendment issues, including a number of those appeals. Uh, he's also a, a, a lawyer, a leader of the bar, uh, was leader of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, also of the Southern California part of the ACLU. Uh, for some years, and I believe the, the immediate past president of the uh, ACLU Foundation of Southern California. Uh, his undergraduate was in political science at Northwestern University, and he did his law degree at Columbia. Um, also joining us, Naomi Gillins. Uh, she's an attorney at the first, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the Electronic Freedom, the Electronic Frontier, I knew I was going to mumble that, Naomi, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which you should tell us more about. Um, she was also previously a First Amendment fellow at the, uh, the Brennan Center. Um, she also um, worked on free speech and privacy issues in both of those settings. Uh, she's a graduate of Harvard Law School and Princeton University and served as a law clerk to the Honorable David J. Barron of the U.S. First Circuit Court of Appeals uh, and the Honorable Indra Talwani of the U.S. District Court for the District of Massachusetts. Uh, finally, and certainly not least, is Professor David L. Hudson, Jr., uh, who is visiting associate professor of legal practice, uh, teaching legal information and communication at Belmont College of Law, Nashville, Tennessee. He's also the author of more than 40 books um, and uh, has worked on First Amendment issues for most of his career. He was a Justice Robert H. Jackson Fellow at the uh, Legal, at the uh, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and a First Amendment Fellow uh, for the Freedom Forum Institute. Uh, for 17 years, he was also an attorney and scholar at the First Amendment Center in Nashville, Tennessee, taught classes at Vanderbilt and uh, the Nashville School of Law. His undergrad was from Duke and his law school was Vanderbilt. So I don't know that we could have found a uh, more distinguished group of folks to join us uh, for the program today. I'm so honored and pleased that they were able to be with us. Uh, thank you all for being with us today. And uh, we will jump right in with a little bit of sort of table setting on the First Amendment itself, if we can. And 
Steve, I'm going to ask you to lead off with it for a second. Uh, first of all, uh, as a reminder, everybody, the First Amendment has a bundle of about six different areas. We will not be focused on some of those tonight, things like freedom of assembly, that sort of stuff. We'll spend our time on freedom of speech, freedom of the press, might get into a little bit of freedom of religion, uh, depending on the, the nature of the speech that we end up talking about tonight. Um, so that's where we'll, we'll spend most of our time uh, with respect to the First Amendment. Uh, but Steve, let me ask you, so the First Amendment, of course, uh, governs the uh, activities of government in relation to speech. Uh, when we're talking about social media companies, we're talking about private companies there. So kind of connect the dots for us a little bit between the notion of private speech uh, and public um, regulation of uh, speech activities uh, that are that's prohibited by the First Amendment. Thanks a lot, Craig. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm enjoying uh, meeting Naomi and, and meeting, reconnecting with David after many years. Uh, this is such an important topic. Um, could the founders uh, 232 years ago today have imagined uh, a world filled with instant uh, communications, with direct messaging, uh, with millions of messages passed uh, among us every day. Uh, this is the, uh, it was heralded as the information age, uh, and yet many people are bemoaning uh, the condition of this form of communication and technology as the disinformation age. And I think that's some of what we want to talk about today. It's so important to start where you did, uh, Greg, because the first word of the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights is Congress. Congress shall make no law. And through an interpretation of the First Amendment that has been applied to states and cities and localities. But what is required for the First Amendment to apply to restrict speech in any way is uh, called state action. It needs a governmental action uh, to bring the First Amendment into play. But there's also the culture of free speech in today's society. There's the, uh, the ethos of being able to speak freely. And so some of those uh, values and interests come into conflict. I think as we go through uh, the evening, uh, it's important to understand that uh, over the history of the First Amendment, it actually is celebrating just the beginning of its 200th year of interpretation by the Supreme Court, which really began in 1919. Uh, we have adopted a marketplace of ideas uh, theory, uh, rejecting an order and morality a view uh, that previously restricted much of what was spoken. And so in the marketplace of ideas, and we could critique that metaphor later perhaps, uh, because like all markets, it's not free, uh, we have robust, wide open free speech. And we start with the premise that that is what platforms like Google and Twitter and uh, Facebook and TikTok and Snapchat they, they come to this, uh, this uh, public arena with wide open free speech. Now, there are exceptions uh, to the First Amendment across the board, and those exceptions apply to newspapers and town halls and rallies and all the rest. We have exceptions for defamation, for invasion of privacy, for a cousin of the invasion of privacy called right of publicity, incitement, real incitement, true threats, obscenity, and you could say copyright uh, has, uh, can be viewed as an exception to the First Amendment in the sense that a copyright owner can hold a monopoly to certain speech. So when we see it in that context, we know there are limitations. Those limitations are going to apply across the board in the social media setting and elsewhere. But the challenge now is how to confront the extent to which 
Uh, people are offended by speech they see in social media, offended by political speech, by religious speech, by social speech. And I think that's really the challenge uh, that this program is facing. You're on mute, Greg. <laughs> Messing around with Don't my papers. Well, I didn't want everybody to hear me scuffling my papers. Thanks, Steve. That was fantastic. Terrific. Um, so it gets us into this question of the role of users of these platforms. So the speech that is primarily being conducted is by the users of these platforms, or is it? Amy, do you want to uh, jump on that one a little bit? Sure. And I would also say, you know, I completely agree with all the things that Steve just laid out. And I think that one of the most important and um, confusing things about the First Amendment and how it operates in today's social media environment is to understand that the First Amendment, you know, it, it prohibits the government from restricting speech, but it doesn't only apply to individuals, right? It also applies uh, to entities, uh, to organizations. So that means that the government can't restrict your speech or my speech, you know, unless it meets a certain you know, bar, but it also can't restrict the speech of uh, Fox News or the New York Times or Facebook or Twitter, the organizations themselves. Um, those companies have their own speech rights also, right? So, so what that means is that the First Amendment will prohibit the government uh, in many instances from telling you or I, you know, what we can or cannot say, but it doesn't prohibit private non-governmental entities like Facebook um, from sanctioning individual speech. And that's kind of intuitive if you think about, you know, if I have a dinner party at my house and someone says something that offends me, I have the right to kick them out of my house, right? Of course. And they're, they have the First Amendment right to, you know, not be prosecuted by the government for saying that, but not to just say it anywhere they want with no consequences whatsoever. Um, and so, so I can, you know, react to people's speech however I want to in my personal capacity. And it's the same thing with companies. Um, and that's why, you know, if you say something that your employer doesn't like, the First Amendment doesn't stop them from firing you for that. Um, you know, maybe your labor contract does, not your employment contract, or maybe, you know, your union that you're a part of might. Um, but the First Amendment, if you're not a government employee, the First Amendment doesn't have anything to say about that. Um, and so what that means is that, you know, Facebook and Twitter and other social media companies have an, you know, they have their own First Amendment right to curate the kind of content that they are hosting on their platforms. And they can enact, the, you know, whatever kinds of policies they want to enact about what kind of speech is allowed and what kind of speech is prohibited on their platforms. Um, whatever they want, you know, it can be things like no hate speech, um, or it can be things like no uh, speech in support of the Golden State Warriors. And all of that is perfectly legal because they are private companies. Um, and if they kick a user off of their platform for violating those policies, then that's not really a First Amendment problem. That's just a dispute between private parties. So it really complicates the, uh, the ability of, um, say, folks who are policymakers to understand how to address the wide reach of these platforms. So it was one thing to come up with the idea of free speech in an era where you could stand on the corner, you could shout on the corner of the, the common and you, whoever happened to show up and stand there and listen to you, or you could print a pamphlet and then pass it around physically and you could reach maybe a thousand people. Um, Facebook has 2 billion users <laughs> worldwide. Uh, David, tell us how that how that comes into play then on the policy side. We have this enormous power that uh, we can shout from the rooftops individually. Um, and as Naomi points out, there's nothing really the government can say about that. Well, it is uh, speech enhancing, right? And the new technologies and the, you can trace it back to the 
United States Supreme Court's decision in, in June of 1997 in Reno v. ACLU, where the, I think the late great Bruce Ennis referred to it as the uh, granting the internet its legal birth certificate. And I know the Electronic Frontier Foundation was very uh, instrumental in that, in, the, in that litigation as well. Um, so in, in, in many senses, it's, it's been very speech enhancing, right? The most democratizing uh, speech enhancing medium uh, ever. Uh, but it's also led to an amplification of all types of speech. So there's good speech, there's speech that people may find quite offensive and harmful and hateful. So there's been a rise in, uh, a rise in hateful expression as well. Um, what I've always struggled with, and it's uh, something I've gone back and forth with, is obviously I'm not a, a fan of governmental regulation. If you, if you argue that uh, we should uh, disband the, the state action doctrine, um, then, then I, in, a, in a sense, that's going to create much greater uh, governmental regulation. Um, sometimes I'll struggle with that, though, when I go back to the, to the state action doctrine, it, it really developed in a group of five cases that were collectively known as the civil rights cases of 1883. Uh, and, and they were very racist uh, cases, frankly. Uh, they involved Frank Stark uh, racial discrimination against people like Sally Robinson, who couldn't ride a railroad car simply because of her, uh, simply because of her race. And it was in that case that the United States Supreme Court majority uh, talked about the fact that uh, the scope of the 14th Amendment was limited to, to state action. It wasn't concerned with, uh, with, with individual liberties. I think where some uh, First Amendment uh, advocates have, have tried to push that a little bit is uh, uh, sort of one, what happens when you have private entities that have such enormous power in reach and can actually engage in much greater censorship than anyone else. So does it make sense that, you know, a, a billion dollar company is, is not subject to speech regulation, but the little bitty town that has 500 people in it does. Um, and the, the, the issue sort of, uh, uh, came even more to the forefront with the Supreme Court's 2017 decision in Packingham versus North Carolina, which struck down a very broad uh, North Carolina law that grossly uh, prohibited uh, former sex offenders from accessing the internet and even prohibited them, for example, for uh, looking up jobs or something. It was clearly an overbroad law, but there was some language in Justice Kennedy's opinion that uh, I think Justice Alito referred to in his concurring opinion as, quote, undisciplined dicta. Uh, and so it was the, there was the hope on the part of some that maybe we could take some of that language in Packingham and maybe use it to expand the reach of the First Amendment. And the, the other aspect, of course, is that um, the federal constitution is a floor, not a ceiling, right? So a state high court is free to interpret its state free expression component as providing greater free speech protection than the United States Supreme Court does in interpreting the First Amendment. And there have been minor incursions on that where, for example, the New Jersey, I think it's the New Jersey Supreme Court has held that uh, condominium associations, even though they're privately owned, are subject to the free expression component of the New Jersey Constitution. And in a couple states, even privately owned shopping malls are potentially, potentially subject. So there's some there's some wiggle room there, but the, the federal courts have been fairly uniform in saying, look, uh, you know, the, the state action doctrine is here. It's a longstanding tradition in the law. And the, the Supreme Court sort of reaffirmed that, I think, in the Halleck case, albeit that was a 5-4 decision. But um, that's kind of. Yep. So we have the chat. Steve, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I, I agree with the flow here. I am reminded that very currently, uh, there is the Ku Klux Klan Act, which says that private parties conspiring with each other uh, can be held accountable uh, for a speech when it's brigaded with violence. And uh, the Charlottesville Unite the Right rallies three years ago, uh, the organizers are now facing a civil action in Charlottesville next month, a trial, 
uh, where they had claimed First Amendment rights to express their hateful messages. But so far, the federal court there has allowed that case to go forward because under the Ku Klux Klan Act, conspiring together to violate constitutional rights uh, can be pursued without violating the First Amendment. So it's a very interesting slice of this, which I think we can all watch as that case uh, goes forward. Uh, I was just going to comment, if, if you want, that this is a very recent reaffirmation in that uh, Freedom Watch case, if you want to move to that, Craig. Sure. sure. So this is a very contemporary doctrine that uh, you do not convert private speech of Twitter, Facebook, or any of these platforms into government speech subject to the First Amendment just because it is so pervasive. Uh, men, some have argued that, and just in May, uh, the uh, Court of Appeals in Washington, uh, in a case brought by a conservative speaker, uh, Laura Loomer and the Freedom Watch, said that there was a conspiracy among uh, these platforms to violate uh, free speech. Some of her speech had been uh, labeled and warned under Twitter's uh, rules, and portions of it were banned. And the, and the court, uh, the district court and the appellate court very firmly came back down that these are not state actors, that while exceptions for like uh, public access television is so laced with municipal involvement that it is an arm of government, uh, in by and large, these are open forums. And that's why this becomes such a, such a challenge because people believe that they are harmed by what they're seeing, uh, whether it's uh, uh, bullying, uh, whether it is personal attacks, as well as political attacks. And that's why this is such a complex area. Yeah, so let's take a, let's take a look at just Twitter for a second on this question. Um, it seems to me that Twitter is one of the purest sort of forms uh, because of the nature of the platform, it's uh, very directly individual speech oriented, uh, short messages, and they go to the people who subscribe to your channel. Uh, doesn't that take the Twitter company, unless they choose to get in the middle of it, pretty well out of the equation entirely? Anybody? Sure, yeah, I'll hop in there. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Twitter, you know, as it's conceived is a medium for people to communicate with one another. Um, you know, same as if I posted up a physical message board outside my house for people on the sidewalk uh, to, to, you know, post things on a bulletin board. Um, but of course, Twitter also has its own policies and community standards and enforces them. And those, you know, change over time. But, you know, certainly if you're posting um, you know, if a person is going to post uh, images, right, of child exploitation, then that's going to be taken down and reported to law enforcement immediately. Um, and not only things like that, uh, but they have all sorts of standards and just most recently, um, and maybe controversially, decided that they were going to start uh, banning uh, political advertisements on their platform. And that just opens up a whole uh, can of worms about how you how these companies are going about moderating their content, right? Because something like child exploitation is like, that is fairly clear cut to identify. Something like, you know, what constitutes a political advertisement? That's actually, it might sound easy. It's a pretty hard line to draw though, it turns out. Uh, so, okay, so maybe they don't allow campaigns to buy advertisements uh, for, you know, elected officials running for office. That seems clear cut. Um, but do they allow issue ads, right? Do they allow um, uh, super PAC to buy advertisements? Do they allow the ACLU to buy advertisements uh, in support of a candidate? What if it's an advertisement in support of um, an issue and not a candidate? What if it's uh, you know just um, fundraising for the ACLU? So it 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 becomes really hard, and it just it just illustrates 
how difficult it is when we talk about, oh, these companies should be moderating the content on their platforms more, they should be curating what's said more. It's actually, it's just a very hard thing for them to be able to do effectively. Yeah, and yet we can't just throw the doors open, right? Uh, you know, we, one, one model of regulation would be to treat them uh, like the phone company uh, that has no job to uh, stop anybody from saying whatever they want to say. They just make the connection and they're out of it as far as the content's concerned. But we can't just treat them that way, though, because of these concerns over things we would say are limits within the First Amendment that we've, we've already discussed. So given that they are still going to make these choices and decisions, how do we decide what, their, what boundaries to put on their range of choice, if any? Do we have any way of deciding to put some barriers around them? Guardrails, if you will? Anybody? Well, well I'll, go uh, ahead, Steve. Well, they are trying. Uh, they are not uh, blind to everything uh, we're talking about. Uh, the problem they have, and we should introduce perhaps at this point, uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which actually has created immunity for these platforms when, uh, to summarize, they are not acting in the role of publisher uh, when they are not expressing their own speech, they are following the analogy, simply a common carrier delivering the speech of others. Uh, so section 230 says it has a good Samaritan uh, exception uh, that to the extent uh, no, they will not be treated as a publisher or speaker uh, uh, for providing information uh, and any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access or availability to material which they consider obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. So it's important to focus here that we give immunity to these platforms if they are trying to restrict that list of categories. That list of categories is broader than would stand up in any First Amendment challenge, partly because of its vagueness uh, and its uh, overbreadth as far as the First Amendment is concerned. But these private entities, therefore, can try to regulate uh, the speech that is on uh, their platforms. And as Naomi said, just this month, uh, Twitter issued its civic integrity policy, and it has taken on the Herculean duty to ferret out manipulating and speech that uh, manipulates or is misleading or false in a civic process, such as an election, uh, they have standards for this. They have an appeal. If you have been uh, muzzled or warned, they also are following a tradition of more speech, not less, by labeling speech. So we already know in the last several weeks, uh, for example, the speech of President Trump has been labeled as misleading uh, when he's talked about voting twice or polling uh, places or the post office. They are trying to serve a civic role by monitoring speech under these standards. It is a vast task. I've read of uh, hundreds of thousands of monitors who are looking at all of this speech. They also have to watch out for child pornography. There's been reports of burnout as uh, these monitors look endlessly at all of this uh, otherwise offensive speech. So they are immune under that act. And in that Good Samaritan role, they are trying to issue guidelines uh, to restrict what on their sites they believe uh, is objectionable. Well, that raises the question, does the Communication Decency Act actually put them in a position where they kind of have to do that? 
In other words, they have the immunity and they have to use it. David, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, in a sense, I mean, the problem I think comes from the fact that some of the decisions, um, you know, let's take Facebook, for example, some of the decisions that are made on, on uh, censoring speech, if you will, uh, seem quite arbitrary and, and, and rather capricious. So, for example, at a, a friend who posted a, a video of Malcolm X speaking, um, and, and got uh, uh, put in Facebook jail uh, for, for uh, uttering hate speech. It was classified as hate speech, you know, and, of, you, know, that, you know, that may have been considered an incendiary speaker in some quarters, but uh, it was also one of the most important uh, figures of the 20th, 21st, uh, 20th century in terms of advocating for racial justice. Think of Dr. King, Malcolm X, and, and Thurgood Marshall. Right. I mean, I um, I worry that uh, a lot of the decisions are are extremely arbitrary. If these decisions were made, for example, by government officials in another context, they'd be quite laughable. Um, uh, so there's there's the, to me there's just a significant amount of uh, room for improvement on uh, on the content curation. And, and just fill me in and fill our audience in on sort of how that Communication Decency Act immunity came about. What was the context for it? Anybody? Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. Come. Well, part of it was uh, to, to facilitate free discussion on the internet and to, and to allow sort of the unfettered, uh, uh, to, to develop free speech, right? To, to not hinder, um, those who were providing a platform for others to speech. So it was designed to be sort of a speech enhancing uh, mechanism. Um, the problem is what happened, I think one of the early cases, a case called Zoran versus America Online, where somebody sued o AOL because they alleged that there was defamatory uh, material about them. Well, look, there's a, if you just go in any court, uh, you can be a state court, uh, any state court in the United States, there's gonna be a lot of online defamation cases, right? Because with rights come responsibilities and a lot of people just post awful things about other people online. Um, and guess what? They get sued for defamation. Well, if you, if you didn't have section 230, then the, uh, the lawsuits wouldn't be one individual suing the other individual, it would be the individual suing the entity that provides a platform and it would chill speech. Um, so that, that's kind of the way I always viewed uh, Section 230 is it was designed to help further uh, First Amendment principles by, by providing uh, greater speech and not, not imposing this freezing effect on the, on the platforms. And I just jump in there just to say that's, you know, exactly right. And, and without Section 230's protections and immunities, it'd be, you know, not only would you have less speech online, but you wouldn't even have these platforms probably at all, because any, you know, small business, a, you know, social media startup, um, they would, they would know that they would face litigation under, you know, 50 different sets of state laws uh, for any kind of speech that a user posts to their platform that someone else is upset about. And it would just make it untenable to run a platform like that as a business. And that doesn't only apply to these giants like Facebook and Twitter, right? But to like whatever your neighborhood association group or, um, you know, a, a chat on, on your library's website or the comment section in your local newspaper, right? These things, Section 230 protects all of these entities um, from being sued for the content of, of what their users post online. But now Section 230 um, has, well, I guess it, we, we won't say it's been attacked, uh, but we do want to talk about the recent executive order, I think, don't we? And maybe the Earn It Act a little bit as well. Somebody want to take one of those, take us through one of those as a starting well, point? Well, I will because okay. uh, this is a, uh, in my view, and I'm eager to hear what my panelists think, is a threat to uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Uh, on May 28th of this year, stung by uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and other commentary uh, on his presidency, uh, President 
uh, Trump issued uh, executive order on preventing online censorship. Now, you, based on everything we've talked about for the last uh, half hour, we know that what these uh, platforms are doing is not censorship. Censorship is a government act of restricting free speech in violation of the First Amendment. Private editing, curating, uh, selecting, uh, and using the Good Samaritan provisions of Section 230 is not censorship. But anyone who looks up the executive order, uh, this is a, uh, a checklist of uh, threats. Uh, it speaks of protecting uh, free speech, but it characterizes the editorial decisions of uh, platforms uh, as uh, censorship, uh, as uh, tilted in uh, political bias, um, as uh, they give right in the order, it says they complain, uh, the White House complains about peddling the long disapproved Russia collusion host, hoax. Uh, and what the order eventually orders is that every government entity uh, look at its own budget and how much money it is spending on social media with a clear threat that if they don't shape up in accordance with this order, uh, federal funding for advertisements on their sites uh, may be uh, suspended or restricted. Uh, they order the uh, Justice Department to look into uh, whether Section 230 uh, is being abused. Uh, for the law students on the call, uh, this uh, is a bill of attainder. Others can Google that in the next five minutes because Twitter and Facebook are named in this executive order as targets. Bills of attainder are laws directed at specific parties. Uh, and it warns uh, that uh, speech that does not align with the uh, principles of this executive order will uh, be targeted. And state governments are encouraged and will have the support of the attorney general for potential enforcement under state uh, statutes, which raises all kinds of federalism uh, laws. Now, uh, to wrap this up, a lot of this is look into it, check it out, report back in 60 days. Uh, every agency, look at your federal budget. So not one word here actually punishes or censors uh, platforms, but it is a powerful warning and when, if any of these provisions were carried out, that would raise serious First Amendment problems because then you would have state action, you would have the federal government clamping down on a private vehicle of speech, uh, and we could be launched uh, into uh, years of uh, litigation. So it's something very important for all of us to be aware of. It seems pretty clear we will be launched into years of litigation over, over those <laughs> provisions. Uh, we actually already have been because EFF, the organization I work for, has already filed a First Amendment lawsuit challenging this executive order. Um, and you know, as Steve was saying, if the government were to actually take away uh, platform section 230 um, immunity because of the way that they are moderating content, clearly that would violate the First Amendment like Steve said, they haven't done that yet. But even just passing this executive order that sets up this system for them to do that in the future, obviously what it is, is, you know, it's a warning to social media companies not to, I mean, at heart, not to flag uh, or moderate the president's posts, right? Um, or, or moderate content in a way that the government doesn't like on, you know, on pain of losing their immunity. Um, and so that already on its own, even without enforcing it, it still has this really severe chilling effect, right? And the potential to affect how companies and platforms are actually responding to 
his posts uh, and people's posts more generally and crafting their policies about it. Um, and so that's its own First Amendment problem. Like you don't even have to actually censor speech as the government to violate the First Amendment. It's enough just to create an environment that chills it and makes people afraid to engage in the speech that they're constitutionally uh, allowed to engage in. And, and just to be clear, would it, uh, I'm sorry, David, I'll get right there. Would it, would it uh, if the government stopped its spending as a result of the executive order, without any further action than that, let's just examine that in isolation. Would that be considered a First Amendment violation? Well, it probably is because it's probably an unconstitutional condition because the government isn't allowed to say, um, okay, you get certain rights or privileges um, as, a, you know, as a private entity uh, from the government as long as you say things that we like, as long as you exercise your free speech rights in a certain way. David, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, I just wanted to reaffirm what the co-panelists said. And I think it was uh, Steve that mentioned that in the bill itself, there's a lot of sort of pro First Amendment language in it. So it's it's a, rather insidious that it's, it's, it's uh, cast as this defender of First Amendment free speech principles. And the, the idea is that is it's designed to sort of ensure uh, viewpoint neutrality. And uh, that takes us to probably, you know, the most fundamental of all uh, First Amendment free speech principles is that generally the government should be neutral with regard to a content and viewpoint. And Thurgood Marshall expressed this probably most forcefully in 1972 in uh, uh, Chicago Police Department versus Mosley. And he said, above all else, the First Amendment means the government may not restrict speech because of its message, ideas, subject matter, or content. And always tell my students that's the miscellaneous quote, right? Message, ideas, subject matter, or content. And that is a principle, this notion. It's been expanded sort of in the Roberts Court era where several justices have been very outspoken about the, the, the dangers of uh, viewpoint discrimination. And they've done that in certain contexts, sort of like the, the scandalous trademark cases, uh, Br uh, Brunetti uh, being one of those. And so what the order is, is it's somebody obviously familiar with strands of First Amendment doctrine and they're, and they're sticking it in there to kind of argue that they are the true First Amendment defenders because certain viewpoints are being squelched. And that's uh, it's sort of, there's a great irony in that. Greg, if I could go one more round on this. Uh, <clears throat> yep. Everything we're saying should be appreciated by the audience irrespective of your political viewpoint, uh, of any place you are on the spectrum. Because if this government or any government starts down the road of picking and choosing disfavored speech to be censored, that's when censorship uh, does apply. Uh, we are in a very dangerous place. Um, Sir Thomas More was quoted as saying, if you cut down all the trees to get to the devil, and the devil and those trees are the laws of England, and you've cut them all down to get to the devil, and the devil turns on you, you will have no trees, you will have no laws, you will have no uh, to protect you. And I think everyone should always step back in these controversies should, even though this is Donald Trump's uh, executive order, if it was a Joe Biden order or a uh, Barack Obama order, I would think the four of us uh, would be saying exactly the same critiques that we are offering today. And uh, with our law professor present, I, I can't be outmatched by an extraordinary quotation uh, from a uh, decision by Justice Robert Jackson uh, in the West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett in 1943, where he said, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. That was a Jehovah's Witness case. 
That's an important fundamental principle. And anybody who cares about their own free speech, the free speech of their political party, the free speech of their organization or association uh, should join in these uh, warning signals when any government uh, starts to intimidate the press, threatens to cut off money to the press, uh, then we are really going down a slippery slope. There's another passage in that opinion that I wanted to emphasize in Justice Jackson, who's probably the greatest wordsmith, I think, in, in Supreme Court history. And it's, 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 I think it's in the latter part of the opinion, and he's talking about that they are educating the youth as reason for scrupulous protections of constitutional freedoms, lest we strangle the free mind at its source and teach youth to discount important principles of government as mere platitudes. And that's the danger, right? If we operate in a society where people don't understand and appreciate First Amendment values and rights, then they're not going to, they're not going to understand when the incursions are made on, uh, made upon them. And it's, it, it, it's right. It's not a political issue. The, the, the Obama administration was oftentimes awful when it came to this suppression of speech. Look at the war on whistleblowers uh, during the Obama administration. It was pathetic. You know, the treatment of Edward Snowden as a traitor when he's really the ultimate whistleblower in society, right? So it's uh, censorship and suppression of speech that happens all across the political spectrum. And it's really what the great Nat Hentoff once said, right? Free speech for me, but not for thee. There's too many people in society, unfortunately, a lot of political leaders who do who who don't appreciate the core First Amendment principle that what is what is the most core First Amendment principle that we have the right to criticize the government? One that thing is very. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. What the Obama administration didn't do was indict Julian Assange. The Trump administration has done that. There are extradition hearings going on right now. We could have a separate uh, webinar. Uh, on the threat to free speech in indicting uh, Julian Assange under the Espionage Act, uh, and it's uh, a part and parcel of what we're talking about. Sure. Well, there's so many things. Uh, we have some. We have that legislation that forces these companies to disclose uh, records that they've kept over that are stored overseas that were um, uh, platform only specifics. We have plenty of threats and none of these are new. <laughs> Folks have tried this all the time over many, many years um, to bring about this spot. So that leads us nicely to sort of my last area and then we're gonna take some questions from our, our audience. Uh, and that is this question of the, what you know is now being called fake news a lot, but presenting as true information that is not true, knowingly false, uh, with a sort of a coordinated purpose uh, to it. And that might be true of one side or the other. Again, we're not being political about this. The, the great risk of these platforms is the ability for that sort of stuff to catch hold. And, uh, for folks, even with the best of intentions, um, with the ability to discern opinion from truth, which by the way, the Pew Foundation found most of us are not terribly good at uh, when we read a statement to discern whether it is opinion or fact. Um, with the power that these platforms have, how do we address that? Uh, I don't see any fire breathing regulators among our panelists. So I'll play that role for just a second here. This is a problem that's out of hand. We've got to do something about this. Uh, what do we do with the power of whoever it is to spread absolute falsehoods and have lots of people believe them that influence in very fundamental and powerful ways choices that folks are making. What, what, what do we do about that problem? You're absolutely right. All the freedoms we care about, what are we gonna do? You're absolutely right and you're absolutely right to raise your voice and, and ask us. Look, this is very serious. But it is not new. Uh, every it is it is on a huge scale, and I never want to diminish that in the context of social media. But every new technology has been alarming in terms of what, how the public 
will be able to navigate its way through this. Uh, newspapers, uh, television, radio, comic books uh, were under assault. And so I grew up, I'm older than all of you, uh, and I think you've heard it anyway, don't trust everything you read in a newspaper. <laughs> well, that's been expanded to don't trust everything you read uh, on the internet. We have got to develop a culture of skepticism, a culture of critical thinking, a culture which does not uh, retweet and forward the last message you got on some political, social, or scientific question. Uh, we have to be good parents uh, with our children and with the moderation of the use of these devices. Uh, we know that suicides are up, that loneliness is up, uh, that this is a huge societal problem uh, that parents have to take note of. We have to develop skills of critical thinking. We need to teach from very early ages what these devices are, and that just because a message pops up on your screen uh, does not mean it's true and that you develop the ability to look at the source, check a second site, reconsider, take a pause, uh, look into the question of what is being spread, um, set limits, uh, don't take your device into your bedroom to uh, <laughs> do endless tweeting and messaging. I think if we can build a, a skeptical, critical thinking culture, uh, we have some chance of navigating our way through this. And I, to finish, I mentioned to the panelists on Netflix right now uh, is a documentary called The Social Dilemma. I can't recommend it enough to everybody who's listening to us, families and friends, children. Uh, it is a alarming documentary uh, on the disinformation age it hints at the end at some of the remedies that we're talking about, and I'm certainly eager to hear uh, what the others have to say. So all agreed, we, we've got work to do in Steve's areas uh, that, he, that he's described so well. Is there anything else we can do? Somebody, anybody have, some, have something else we can do? I mean, I'm, I'm gonna sit here as the government, I wanna do something about this, what can I do? You know, it's funny because so many people right now, including myself and my friends and family, look at the current environment of misinformation online on these social media platforms, and you want someone to do something about it, right? Someone to say this can't be, you know, you can't be sharing these kinds of lies or rumors. But if you just step back from that and think about like, okay, who is actually going to be deciding what's a lie or what's a rumor and who's going to be enforcing that? The answer is the government, right? Right now, that's the Trump administration, right? That's Bill Barr and the DOJ. And who knows, you know, if next year, maybe that's the Biden administration, but whoever it is, is that the person that you actually want to be deciding what's true and what's false and then policing your speech, right? To decide if you're spreading rumors. And it's, it's another one of these instances where it sounds like something maybe where it's, it's doable, but in fact, it's not even really possible to do that, right? Like what's, what's a rumor? I mean, if you look at the current crisis uh, with COVID and you think about, um, you know, okay, well, the doctor who first blew the whistle on this in China was arrested by China and prosecuted for spreading rumors, right? Because what he was saying conflicted with the official government narrative of what was happening with COVID. In March, you had the government, uh, you know, the, the CDC here in America saying, don't wear masks, masks are harmful. And then three weeks later, they said, you know, completely changed the position on that and said, everybody should be wearing masks. Um, so, so what we're asking for sort of is a, is a system where the government is going to be pr like prosecuting people for questioning the mask guidance for questioning the spread of COVID when the numbers aren't consistent with the numbers that the government is giving for you know all sorts of, of things being officially reported. I don't, speaking for myself, I don't want to live in a country of which there are more and more where the government has the power to um, 
detain, arrest, prosecute, jail people uh, for saying information that conflicts with official government narratives. And we've seen more countries enacting these kinds of laws since the pandemic has started. And in a ton of these countries, they're being used to detain journalists and whistleblowers and political dissidents, members of opposition parties, and it's happening around the world. All right, so as a go I guess the government's not the solution, but we are, uh, we're sort of handing that power to our social media companies to police what goes on on their platforms. And I guess, David, we can choose to join or not join, right? We have that ability that we don't have yeah. in some other kind of sort of context. And it all goes back to this idea that uh, we were talking about in the beginning of the hour about having a marketplace of ideas and hoping that, you know, by opening the doors to any kind of speech, um, we will, you know, the speech that is good and accurate and true and socially beneficial will rise to the top. Does that actually happen? Well, you know, that's up for debate, but I don't think it's really worse now than in any other point. All right, well, let's turn to, a, uh, we have just a couple of minutes. We've got a couple of questions. Uh, so global, first question is sort of a global question um, from an, someone from an international jurisdiction post hate speech on a US-based platform using a made up account. So the question from the audience member is why shouldn't the internet provider be held liable for that kind of thing? I have a few thoughts on this. I don't mean to monopolize this conversation, but two things. First of all, if someone violates the laws, you know, in their country where they live, then they can absolutely be held liable in that country. Here in America, though, hate speech actually is not um, illegal. It's protected speech under the First Amendment. You have every right to engage in hate speech. What you can't do is um, commit a hate crime. So if that speech, uh, if, if you're committing violence, or inciting other people to violence using hateful speech, then maybe you'll be convicted of a hate crime. But the speech on its own is not unlawful. And the reason is really the same kind of, uh, of logic that underlies the reason why uh, lies are protected speech also. And that is who decides what hate speech is, right? You can say that hate speech should be barred, but then is it gonna be Bill Barr and, and Trump deciding what speech is hateful? Um, is it going to be, you know, President Obama or President Biden deciding that? Well, either way, I think a large uh, proportion of the country is going to be unhappy with how they're enforcing that and what they're deciding. And we've actually seen that play out. Like in Spain, um, there aren't the same kinds of protections for speech. And just two years ago, there was a teacher who posted on Facebook um, calling police uh, lazy. And she was prosecuted for hate speech against the police. The international setting raises a lot of serious questions. You're right, Craig, and, and the questioner is right. First of all, you get into the problem of the lowest common denominator. If China uh, introduces restrictions uh, on internet uh, speech in China, we would never want the United States or any country, I mean, we would never want the United States to be bound by lower or more restrictive standards around the world. We actually tried to lift the boat uh, of uh, free speech by having the, some of the most robust standards to protect uh, free speech. And studies have shown that when uh, governments, and these are in democracies uh, in England, France, Germany, and elsewhere, when they have gone down the road of uh, purporting or attempting to restrict what they call hate speech, a lot of speech of minority groups, of people of color, of uh, outsiders, of uh, uh, people who are opposing the government have been censored in the mix. So you do not, you're not guaranteed that the speech you hate is going to be eliminated. Uh, the studies show that it is a broad swath of speech that gets eliminated. Uh, so we've got studies now uh, to look at which would uh, augur in favor of not adopting those international models. Great, thank you very much. 
Well, we are just at the top of the hour, uh, and I want to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for coming and joining us for this Constitution Day observance. Uh, for those who are in the audience who didn't get a chance to get your answer uh, to your question, um, I will stick around after the formal program and engage in dialogue with those who have questions about this topic. I don't expect our panelists to do that, but of course, I'm happy to, uh, to stick around for a little bit. Um, if you have questions about St. Francis School of Law, uh, I wanted to mention that we will be having a couple of information sessions online about that. Uh, one is on September 30, another one is on October 15, as I recall. And uh, so uh, stay tuned or look for information about those uh, coming up for questions about the law school. Um, that said, I want to thank everybody once again for joining us. Very exciting, interesting uh, topic. Very difficult to cover um, completely in an hour, but I think we did an excellent job of covering it well within an hour. And so uh, David and uh, Stephen and uh, Naomi, thank you so much for being a part of this Constitution celebration, Constitution Day celebration. And uh, we'll sign off now. And, and once again, I hope to see you uh, out there in the in the world in the uh, uh, arena fighting all the good fights uh, for our freedoms. Thank you very much.